So, what did we do last week? Well, I introduced you to some of the um, stranger behaviours that quantum physics seems to allow, such as superposition, so that's the fact that the particle seems to be in all of the possible places it can be, and that doesn't mean any possible place, but just the places it could be, that could only be two different places, before you measure where it is. And that there is a measurable difference between it being in two different places at the same time and one place or the other place. And that measurable distance has been measured on many, many, many occasions, and it makes a difference. And also to entanglement, where the properties of, of various particles in a system are inextricably linked. And although those properties don't exist until you try and do a measurement and find out what those properties are, as soon as you do, any other particle that's entangled with it, that depends on that property, will then have the corresponding property that it needs. And we talked about these very strange interpretations of these ideas. So the theory is makes predictions and there's mathematics behind it. And, you know, so that's all fine. Um, making predictions is fine and, and we can um, do useful stuff. But, but what is going on is a very difficult thing to answer and, um, and, is, and is a very hot topic of research still. And to show you quite how uh, kind of contested it is. Here is a list from Wikipedia. You can hardly see it, but maybe you can see it in your notes. This is what Wikipedia lists as the common interpretations of which I told you. Copenhagen interpretation with um, um, decoherence, which I called orthodox quantum mechanics. And I told you about many world theory. Um, and I told you about the broid bone theory. Uh, and that was it, was it? Yes, I think so. Um, so... There are many, many ideas. And then that's not even it. So brilliant. It also lists minority interpretations of quantum physics. You can see there's a list including things such as the uh, pro-wave interpretation and quantum mysticism. So, um, and people work on these things. So, so if you feel it's very unsatisfactory, um, the explanation of what's actually going on in quantum physics, well, you'd probably be right because people are arguing about it a lot. But I want to move on from this for the next few lectures, the last, we're halfway through, and I'm going to try and brush that aside a little bit um, and focus on what to me as an experimental physicist is the important thing, which is quantum physics makes predictions and these predictions can be tested and is this of any use to us? And in particular, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about how quantum physics has allowed us to understand many other areas of physics. Um, in the next lecture, I'll talk about what new things we've been able to do with our understanding of quantum physics. But for this lecture, I'm going to show how quantum physics explains other areas of physics which are maybe already known about, um, but which could not be explained without quantum physics. So here... I'm summarising that again. So, can things such as this wave particle nature of reality and entanglement and superposition actually explain such things as the table in front of us and, you know, the particles flying through the universe and everything like that? And the answer is, uh, yes, it nearly explains everything. Yeah, I'll give it away. And we'll start with particles and forces. I'll go through this reasonably fast because um, this touches on an area called quantum field theory, which is um, a major development in quantum physics in about the 50s and, and, and could take up many lectures on its own. And it's something I'm not personally a massive expert in, and, and so I'll, I'll go over it reasonably fast. We've talked about this Schrodinger equation before. We said that, you know, Schrodinger noticed that things seem to be behaving in a bit of a wave-like way, and so he guessed an equation which he knew would work for waves, see if it could describe the world around us, and indeed it does seem to describe useful things, such as the structure of atoms, 
where you can predict lots of things once we knew the, the structure of atoms. Um, but there's a, in terms of modern physics, there's a bit of a problem with this equation. So the right-hand side, so the psi, which is this three-pronged Greek method here, is um, the wave function. It describes our quantum mechanical system in some way. And um, if we solve this equation, we can extract the energy of the system. And if we know what energies the system can have, then we can predict pretty much everything it's going to do. But the problem is it seems to have time built into it here, here, and here, and even on the left-hand side, it tells you entirely about the time um, evolution. And the problem is that the time um, is not such a special quantity uh, nowadays. I mean, it is special, but it's no more special than, than uh, position and such like, um, because relativity, special relativity, tells us that time is a relative quantity. It depends on the observer. It depends on how fast you're going and such like. Um, you know, so there are experiments where they put very good clocks in aeroplanes and then they fly the aeroplanes in different directions around the Earth. And when they stop doing that, the clocks have, start, have got to different points. Right? The, the clocks go at different speeds because they're going in opposite velocities around the Earth. Time is an entirely relative um, quantity. It's not some kind of absolute thing. So what's so special about time? The answer is there's not much special about time in quantum physics. And I'm gonna, what's special in quantum physics, which I mentioned right at the end of the very first lecture, is when I was saying about what, what is actually quantized. This whole theory and the name comes from the fact that it seemed that certain things came in chunks. Light seemed to come in chunks, and the energy of electrons and materials seem to have set. Um, levels, they couldn't have an energy in between there sometime. And I mentioned to you that actually what's quantized is a property called the action, um, which is very simply, if I start in one place and I end in another place, I can go on any kind of complicated route. And I can measure, as I've done that, how the kinetic energy has changed and how the potential energy of that particle has changed. And whichever one um, comes out with the smallest number, if I add up all along this path, which is what integral means, and if you add up all along here, whichever comes out as the one that has the smallest number is the one which will happen in nature. And, um, and that seems to be in quantum physics what is quantized. The units of action are the same as the units of Planck's constant, which pops up everywhere. And it turns out that very usefully, action is an invariant quantity. Um, it's observer independent. So what this means is just like energy, it doesn't matter if one of you is on a spaceship receding at 0.9 times the speed of light across the galaxy. Um, if you were doing the same experiment or looking at the same experiment as someone who was stationary, then you'd get the same answers. It's an invariant quantity. Unlike time, you'd argue about how long something would take. You'd argue about how long something was, for example, if one of you was going very, very fast and the other was relatively not, um, but you'd measure the same energy and you'd measure the same action. And this little bit in the middle can be quite complicated depending on your system you're thinking about, and it's got a name in itself, it's called the Lagrangian, this difference in energies. And the Lagrangian is important um, because this is now something which we call quantum field theory, and it's the marriage of the quantum theory we've already talked about and special relativity, um, not general relativity. And that's a problem that's still being worked on. General relativity and quantum physics don't get along. But special relativity and quantum physics do get along, and that theory is called quantum field theory. So what's useful? Well, these particular equations, which are called Lagrangians, are all of a certain form of equation. And they all obey certain rules. So if you work out what it is based on your system, if you work out how the energy is going to change in your system, then you can guess a lot of things about your system. And in particular, these equations are field equations, um, which means they're equations that look like um, the kind of equations that would govern uh, classical electromagnetic fields. Um, in Maxwell's theory, um, so you imagine that there is some kind of you know, what a field is. You know, that's a, Another hard question to answer, but there's some kind of emanation of, of a potential to do some work 
by one thing or another, just like a magnet has a field around it that stretches out and it can exert a force on something without having to touch it. So it's a theory of fields in this way. And what quantum field theory says is that for each kind of class of particle, there is a field, and that field is everywhere, it's just part of the structure of reality. So for example, the electron field. And if you excite that field, if that field gets some energy somehow, then a particle pops out, just like this. It's an, the particle is the excitation of the field. And so in particular, one really important thing this leads to, which we will come back to, is that because of this, so for example, the electron is the ex excitation of the, you know, the field for the electron. Every single electron in the universe that's excited in this way is completely indistinguishable. They're not little, you know, blobs. You could draw something on it tiny, you could give it a name. Right? Every single electron that has the same energy is identical anywhere in the universe. If you create one excitation of its field that's the same, they're completely indistinguishable. Um, it makes no sense to talk about them as separate entities. Um, yeah, so all electrons are the same, all photons will be the same, the, you know, an excitation of the photon field, etc. Um, but why is this useful? It's useful because when you do find these equations, you know, which just takes a bit of thinking about by some very clever people, it tells you all kinds of useful things. So, for example, um, if you solve this equation for the electron, as I showed you, that's a whole field of physics called quantum electrodynamics. And that tells you all of these things. It predicts that there's an anti-electron just popped out of this. So that was um, called a positron. So that was predicted long before it was seen. It, predict, it predicts that electrons interact with each other via photons, so that just comes out of the theory. And incredibly usefully, all of Maxwell's equations just popped out all of a sudden out of this theory. So people, you know, applied this theory where they mix special relativity and quantum theory, and all of a sudden it predicted loads of other areas of physics they hadn't even tried to predict, and it makes other predictions about um, things you can do. And that's all just from one equation, and there are tons of these equations. Right, so we learn all kinds of things about all different particles and their behaviours just by um, solving this, this equation and by looking at this action, um, which seems to be somehow the thing that is quantized. So, who worked on quantum field theory? Well, many, many people, and I picked out two um, uh, who are most famous, and they couldn't really be more different people. So this is Paul Dirac. Um, who is one of these people who's exceedingly famous among scientists, but less famous among non-scientists. And so um, Dirac was English, and uh, he was really fund fundamental in the development of all of quantum mechanics. Whenever I've drawn these little funny symbols and shapes with these, these uh, triangular-shaped brackets and stuff, that was him. He came up with all these things, which made it all a lot easier. And um, he, his main desire was to unify electromagnetism and quantum theory, which he did. Um, and, um, and that predicts much of the motion of electrons, and electrons are the part of matter that tend to interact with things. So that's very, very useful. Um, and so he won the Nobel Prize in 1933 for that. Um, and another person who is very important in quantum field theory, who I bet you've all heard of, is Feynman. Um, and um, he, well, famously was a very intuitive physicist who claimed like he saw equations in different colours and such like. And, um, and he, he was also, at the time, like the most famous physicist of his time. Um, and he really, what he did that was useful, um, almost ironically, is he, um, he made quantum field theory be able to actually spit out useful numbers, normally incredibly technical and dry numbers, but actually useful numbers. He actually really managed to get this complicated field theory, which had quantum mechanics in it, and he used it to predict things that were useful, such as, you know, some fundamental constants of matter and such like you could go away and measure. And, and you know, he was able to predict these things using the equations um, and, and tiny corrections of things that people would just kind of ignored that the theory and, you know, and real life didn't seem to quite match up. And he was excellent at um, doing this and he so he kind of um, unified some theories of, of, of the, the electromagnetic radiation quantized and the motion of electrons being quantized to um, 
to explain the motion of all electromagnetic fields and electrically charged particles. And there are completely opposite people. So Dirac was famously awkward and shy and very thorough and incredibly modest. There are several things named after him that were named after him in his lifetime. He always refused to, name, to, to refer to them by his own name. If it was him and someone else, he'd always use the other person's name. Um, and he, he was only focused on science, which I, for anyone who's uh, thinking of even possibly being a scientist, I would say that 99% uh, of the best scientists are people who are interested in a vast range of things. Durant was only science. He was completely baffled by any of his colleagues who read books or listened to music. Um, so he was talking to Heisenberg once, um, and you know Heisenberg was like, oh, I love going out dancing and such like, you meet nice girls. And Durant was like, how do you know they're nice until you've met them? You might be dancing with a horrible person. Why would you even want to do that? I couldn't imagine anything worse. And um, he, uh, and then like um, in a, in kind of um, a reverse, as I'm sure was um, prompted by extreme awkwardness, he once met, met Feynman when Feynman was very junior and he, he, Dirac was not so junior. And they were sat next to each other at a conference and they just sat there awkwardly. And Feynman is famously boisterous but they were both kind of a bit awkward and and uh, Dirac just turned to him and goes so I have an equation named after me do you have one named after you I guess you know that was like his opening gambit which was uh, as far as I can tell incredibly uncharacteristic and only Feynman could have brought that out of him Feynman being someone who loved playing music and doing art and famously um, notoriously used a strip club as, as his second office he was much more there working than he was um, in the university, and in fact, he was the only person when uh, they tried to shut down the strip club. He was the only person brave enough to to then go and stand stand up and say in its favour. You know, all the other, of course, customers didn't really want anyone to know who they were. He was like, "Ah, you got to, you know, save this place. It's great. It helps me work." He was also really interested in in seeing because he because he did really picture the, these equations very clearly in his head. He was very interested. He he started experimenting very heavily with drugs to see how they could help him develop his physical theories, but he actually, uh, perhaps wisely, got uh, very concerned that it would damage him and his you know, ability to think, so it was a very short-lived, but he, he, had a, he, had a, he had a go, um, and, uh, and he's been you know, the focus of plays and films and such like, very famous enigmatic man. Um, so yes, so if you find these equations and you find all the solutions to these equations, they just tell you what kind of particles you can have. So you think of a system that's you know um, um, you know um, that exists in nature, and then you work out this equation for it, and you solve this equation. All of a sudden, it says, well, you've got to have some particles with this kind of spin that have this kind of mass that move in this kind of way. And it all just pops out and says, nature will tell you. But if you have that system, you must have these particles. And so this is called particle physics. Um, and um, it also um, leads to another really interesting thing, which is um, if you can do something to your equation without changing it, and that's called a symmetry, so without changing the answer you get. So say you take your whole equation and you take all the coordinates in that equation, you rotate them or something, but it doesn't change the, the answer you get out. Um, that's called a symmetry um, of, the, of the equation, and um, and that leads to something really important, which I'm going to talk to you about. Um, right, we'll see how we get on. Otherwise, I'll have to just stop the recording. Um, okay. So, the important thing for us when we're going to start thinking about solids here is that really the only part of the atom that the world sees is the electron. It interacts nearly entirely with everything around it via the electron. Its mass is contained in the nucleus for sure, but any interaction it has with anything around it, including the next nearest atoms around it, is via the electrons. So we're going to think about the electrons. What does quantum theory have to say about how an electron behaves in a solid? This is going to be my toy picture. So let me explain this a little bit. 
So these are my atoms at different positions, and you know they have some kind of energy that they exert on the electrons. They're positively charged for a start. The electrons are negatively charged. So they have some kind of energy at the position of these atoms. This is how we're going to start thinking about it. And we're going to think about the solids. We're going to think about a big lattice of atoms. So atom, 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 atom. And they're separated by a distance A. And here I've got my electron, which has a wave function. But what does the wave function of this electron look like in this solid? So the wave function tells you about your quantum mechanical system. In this case, you couldn't just have a wave function of the electron because it's interacting with these atoms. You need to think about what the wave function of this, this solid is. So what can we do? And the man who solved this problem is Felix Bloch, who got the Nobel Prize in 1958 um, for NMR. But this was actually in 1928. This is part of his PhD thesis, and it, it uh, forms the basis of our understanding of all solids. It's amazing that it in his PhD. And so what his idea was is that the wave function of the electron is periodic in a solid, which means that, you know, because the, the solid itself is periodic, it's like atom, 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 the, the, probably the wave function also has some kind of period in it. It probably repeats somehow. It's kind of a repetitive pattern, which seems like a reasonable place to start. So in a kind of mathematical way, what he said here was the wave function at a position will be the same as the wave function at that same position, but translated by one of the spacings in this lattice. Remember that A was the gap between the atoms. Okay? Um, and in fact, he went further than that, and he said, well, it looks like this. And so what does this mean? So this E to the I, K, X thing, it's called a plane wave. And what, that, what a plane wave is, is if you were to drop a um, stone in a pond and you get the ripples coming out, that shape is a, is a plane wave in 2D in that particular case. Um, K here is, is the wave vector is just related to the, um, both the wavelength and it's also the momentum of the particle. The, the momentum of the particle is directly proportional to that number there. So it's got some kind of wave nature that depends on its momentum to how fast it's going. And then everything else is hidden in this little function here, which also repeats to be periodic. Um, and so it means that there's some wave nature in this solid, and then it repeats, repeats, repeats. And so all of the mystery is hidden in this um, little potential thing, which is what you have to try and solve um, and work out. But there are also, like we've been helped out many times, there are certain rules that it behaves. So how does this help us? So because you have, you know something about the wave function, it means you know something about the energy of the electron. If you know something about the energy of the electron in this solid, then you know something about how it's going to behave, because the energy is what kind of governs how anything will behave. Think about the energies that electrons have in various systems. So here's uh, one very simply uh, simple um, example, which is if I have a totally free electron. So I've got an electron just whizzing through the middle of space somewhere. Okay, And so what the energy of this electron is, I, I think I even solved this maybe at the end of the, the, the second lecture, just to show you that, that you can solve these Schrodinger equations, is that the bigger the K gets, which means the faster you go, the more energy it has, which is entirely obvious. Um, the higher the momentum, the more energy it has. Um, and so just to show you that, that the wavelength points the other way, this is the Broglie wavelength. So this is very short wavelength up here, very high energy. You have to get the energy very low to see long wavelengths and then to see quantum effects. Okay. So that's one extreme, is the electron that's entirely free, which isn't very much like a solid at all. And then the other um, um, example is the electron in a perfect box. I also solved this at the end of the second lecture. So this is saying I have a box with walls that you can't break through, or say that the potential energy of those atoms was somehow so large the electron couldn't possibly get past them. These barriers were infinitely high for the electron. So it's confined between two atoms. And then what you get is you find that the energies are completely quantized. You, get, you have this energy and this energy and this energy, but nothing in between. So that's what you're getting. So these are two limiting cases. The electron that's entirely free and can move anywhere it wants to the electron that's entirely confined 
And we know that electrons aren't entirely confined in solids. For example, they can move in an electron, and that's what an electric current is. So the answer is somewhere in between these two things. It's what you find. Like this. So remember, this is the momentum it has, and this is the energy it has. So this tells you how the electrons can move within this solid. And what you get is you get a gap here. So we can have all of the energies uh, in this gap. So it can be going very slow and have a very low energy, and then you push it harder and harder, and it, and it has a higher energy. But then there'll be a jump until it can get to the next momentum. And this is called a band gap. So there's a gap in the energy. And the, so it's very hard. You can't possibly have this energy in this region. And you have to give it a push to get over that jump of at least this amount. You may have even heard the term band gap. Um, and the size of the band gap in, in depends on the material. And the origin of the band gap, you know, I gave you those kind of pictures of the free electron and the bound, fully confined electron. But the origin of it is a quantum effect. It's quantum interference. The wave nature of the particle um, causes interference within the solid that, that cancels out those energies. So it can't have those energies. So I'm going to draw you like a toy picture here of what might be going on. This red, these red horrible squiggly lines this is just a toy picture um, and a wave function, you know, the size of the wave function maybe. Um, and so what it predicts is that, you know, the wave function may have very complicated shapes, but they repeat roughly, uh, well, they repeat at these, these um, at each atom, so it's kind of periodic like this. And in the energy, so this is the lowest energy wave function in the next one, um, and then there's a gap before you get to the next set of energies that it can have. So it can have all of the energies between these two points in the way I've drawn it here, but it can't have any energies in this bit in the middle. And in fact, if the lattice of the atoms was perfect and infinite, and there was no default in it, if it was a perfect crystal, then the wave function of the electron in this solid would spread over the entire thing, and it would just be completely delocalized everywhere. The electron wouldn't be moving around, it would be all over this crystal um, at the same time, in a perfect crystal, um, like a standing wave. Um, so, which actually would mean that um, the, uh, the electron wouldn't technically be moving, it would be, have, you know, be in this lowest energy, it wouldn't really be moving. Anyway, that's a digression, because it's very hard to make a perfect crystal. To understand the impact of this, I do have to tell you some other facts. I have to go on a little sidestep. And it's this. To understand this. So all objects have a property which we, as physicists, like to call spin. And um, it's called that for a very good reason, because it's just like an angular momentum. So if you get a ball and you spin it, then it will, then it will until friction makes it slow down, it will conserve its angular momentum. It will keep on spinning until it stops spinning. And you know you get a gyroscope and you spin it, it's very hard to turn it on its side because the angular momentum is pointing in one way, you have to give it quite, quite a push to, to break that angle. Um, and so all particles have a property like this, but I do have to tell you that they're not actually spinning. And so, um, in fact, do you remember this, this confusing example I gave you of the superposition principle where we had something with an energy pointing up and an energy pointing down? That actually in that experiment is equivalent to something where a spin is pointing clockwise and a spin that's going anti-clockwise. So um, if you get a gyroscope, it's played with a gyroscope, and you spin it really hard, then the angular momentum is pointing up, and that's why it sits pointing up and it's spinning around this way. And that's the way the angular momentum points for something that's spinning clockwise. If you span it the other way, it'd be pointing down. And every particle has one of these. And the spin comes in units of our friend the Planck's constant, and that would be half integers, so half h-bar, three halves h-bar, etc. Or it can be integers, one h-bar, two h-bar, zero h-bar. Um, so we can have all of the um, these, and it turns out that the behavior, depending on the property, so for example, spin determines magnetism. So the spin of, when all the spins are pointing in the same way in an object, and then it gets the magnetic field. So it means it's a real property of the object, like charge or something that has an outcome. And it just turns out that we, we split all these into, into bosons and fermions, and I'll maybe talk about them a bit later, 
Um, and electrons are these half integer ones, which we call fermions, named after um, Enrico Fermi. And um, the man who came up with a very useful um, consequence of this spin was um, Pauli, who was um, an Austrian, and he was actually in his lifetime, I mean, he he was very famous, um, again, among physicists, and um, but really what he was famous for was something called the Pauli effect, which was that um, whenever he used to go into a lab, equipment used to blow up in the lab, right? It became like a bit of a joke, but he took it very seriously. He really believed that every time he walked into a lab, equipment blew up, and um, this meant that he went on a massive sideline of research into parapsychology, and also teamed up with Carl Jung, did a lot of work on this, and synchronicity, so if there's some deep um, underlying um, importance to coincidences, and then they're not just coincidences. Um, but anyway, for what I'm going to tell you about, he won the Nobel Prize in 1945, even though he's nuts. Um, and so it turns out that there's no two fermions can have the same quantum state. So what does this mean? It means if I had two identical electrons, then they couldn't sit having exactly the same energy. It's just impossible. It just, it just cannot happen. And I, I will show you right after the end of this lecture why that is in terms of maths. Um, but it's absolutely impossible um, for these two things to have exactly the same energy. And so if you want to have um, particles of, of at the same kind of energy level, they have to be different somehow. And so one way, for example, is their spin. And so you could have one that has a spin pointing up. Think of it like spinning clockwise, or there's nothing spinning. And one with the spin pointing down, spinning the other way. This would be perfectly allowed. These two could sit at the same energy, but have this different property. They would no longer be identical. Um, but you wouldn't be able to add another electron in here because another electron um, can either be spin up or spin down, have plus or minus. There's, there's nothing else it could have. It, its property is fixed. You can either put one that's gone up or down in here, and that wouldn't be allowed because then there'd be two identical. Um, um, uh, fermions uh, in this energy level. You'd have to either try and give it a different energy or you know, change some other property. It would be impossible. Um, and this is a property of fermions, but not bosons. Anyway, but we'll see. But this explains why um, the whole periodic table, right? Because, because it explains that electrons have to sit in these pairs. And so, for example, when you look at the periodic table, they sit in, um, you know, you, you get electrons coming in pairs of a given energy and in a given angular momentum. Um, but then they can have a different angular momentum in the system by, say, tracing out a different um, shape within the atom. And so it explains the whole the periodic table where the, uh, the electrons have to come in pairs and then you have to you know, find the next um, thing that you can describe them that differentiates them before you can put any more electrons in. So maybe you can find other things that differentiate them apart from the spin. Um, and that's what you have to do to fill up the periodic table. So it explains it all. So a fermion is um, any particle where the spin, um, this property it has, is equal to a half integer. Um, so it's entirely abstract here. So um, fermions, um, electrons are fermions, and um, say photons are bosons, they can only have a um, full integer um, spin, 0, 1, 2, etc. And atoms, they can be either, depending on their constituents, you know, um, because they're made up of lots of other particles. Their total spin can be it can be bosons or fermions, and it turns out that their, how they behave is drastically different depending on whether they're fermions or fermions or bosons. It changes a lot of physics, and it all comes down to this Pauli exclusion principle, which says that no two fermions can um, identical fermions can have the same um, energy, and the same quantum state. Okay, so let's apply this because it's technical. And then we'll see how it works. So here's my solid with a band gap in it. So if remember, this is kind of like the, the momentum of the electron, this is its energy. And so I give it a push, and it goes up here, it goes a bit faster, and it gets a bit more energy. But then it can't, it needs a, a really big push to go this jump. There's a jump of energy to then be able to reach this next band. And so if I imagine that in my material, the, the last electron I put in there, I only have one. So I could fit another electron in here. 
Okay? Um, so I can easily give this system uh, a bit more energy. I can turn another electron in even, but it sits here, and it can go up here, or it can go down here. So if this is my little electron and I give it a push, its energy changes, and it speeds up and slows down, and because it's not full up of electrons. And this explains thermal and electrical conductivity. In these materials, I can just push the electrons along. I can give them a bit more energy really easily. Um, and so that explains thermal and electrical conductivity. Uh, the fact they're malleable, I can rearrange how my solid, my lattice looks, um, because there's a lot of room for the electrons to shift their energies around. Um, reflectivity, because um, well, the way they interact with photons, um, they can interact with photons and reflect them back at you. Um, and so, for example, this is metals. This is metals where um, you have an unfilled energy state here. You could fit in some more um, fermions or electrons here, um, and uh, you're below this band. And then we have another idea, which is here I have a really big band, and it's full up. I can't fit any more electrons in there. And there's a big band gap. And so this means it's very, very hard to give these electrons any energy. And if this band gap is big enough, then if I shine light at it, it can't even kick this electron up here. It can't kick it anywhere, so the photons just go straight through it, which means it can be transparent if this gap is big enough. So these are insulators. So a lot of insulators tend to be transparent. They don't have to be, like glass and such like. And that's why I can't think of any transparent metals. Um, to physical wavelengths anyway, um, and you can't give the electrons any energy, you can't move the electrons around in it, as insulators, insulators tend to be brittle, okay? so here we have some abstract quantum notion of spin and fermions leading to explaining the difference between metals and insulators. We have the um, really interesting um, situation where my, my band is full, these are full, um, but this gap is really small. So I can get one of these electrons, I can kick it out of here uh, into another um, energy. Yeah. Uh, those have to be very high energy photons that can kick, um, kick the electrons out, and, and the photoelectric effect works with metals. So you can, give, you can give a lot of energy to these things. Um, those electrons, and you give them enough energy, in fact, you kick them out of the entire material. Um, okay, so we, here we have a material where this band gap is full, so nothing really happens, it won't really conduct anything, I can't move the electrons very much, but the energy I need to give it to allow it to start conducting and such like is quite small. So, for example, I could just put some energy into the system to kick this electron up, and now this electron is free to move. It's got loads of um, space to move. And so there's my electron down the bottom, and so then I can then I can push that electron around. Um, all I have to do is give it that bit of energy to kick it over the gap. So, for example, it might be a voltage that you might apply to this material that kicks that electron over the gap, and then it can conduct. Or possibly, if it's just right, light can make it conduct. And so this is, which is solar power, and so this is a semiconductor, which is about the most important technological invention around us. Um, um, and so what a semiconductor allows you to do is to build a transistor. What a transistor is, is a little switch where you apply a very small energy, which would be the energy just to kick this electron up to here, and then this electron can move around by lots, so then you can have a large current flow. So it's a little switch that lets a large current flow. You only need to put in a tiny bit of energy just to kick this over the band gap, and then this material goes from being an insulator to being a conductor. And that's a transistor, which can act as a switch or an amplifier. So these three guys developed the um, transistor in the 40s, Shockley, Bardeen, and Brattain. And um, and they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1956 for it. Um, and in fact, uh, Bardeen, in the middle there, he won the Nobel Prize twice. And he'll, he'll come up again later in this lecture. Um, 
Now, Shockley had a huge ego, and he hated sharing the Nobel Prize. Um, and he'd been working at Bell Labs, which was a big research institute in the US, which many of the important technological advancements of the time came from. Um, but he started his own research company called Shockley Semiconductors, and eight of his original researchers left because he was just so domineering, and he just didn't. And he also refused to work on silicon. He thought silicon was not going to be the useful material. He was working on some, I can't even remember what he was working on, germanium or something. Right? Silicon was a useful one. And he called them like for the rest of his life, the treacherous eight. Um, and between these eight people, he started up 65 new companies, and that's Silicon Valley. Um, so, uh, so that all came from this first development of the transistor. Uh, that's, that was the technology that started Silicon Valley. Um, and, but Shockley was also an accomplished magician, rock climber, and had some very deeply dodgy views about eugenics. Uh, um, how uh, the race of someone affects their ability as a human being. Um, and so the transistor is other little switches that live in all electronic devices now, so in all the computer processes. And, you know, people continue to squeeze more and more and more into a chip. So um, let's see what the, the state Which, who knows, maybe this is finding the limit to transistor technology, is uh, the single atom transistor, which you can read more about here. Um, so here, uh, there's an incredible experiment managed to place a single phosphorus, I think, um, uh, atom here, right in the middle. And these are the electrodes. And so they can control um, this atom in the middle using these two, and so it could be set that it wouldn't let any charge go through, and then they could change this voltage, and all of a sudden you could send the current through this way. So they made a transistor using one atom, uh, which I'd struggle to imagine how you can make something smaller than a single atom um, uh, transistor. And so there are also semiconductor materials such as selenium, um, where the energy you need to make the material conduct um, is low enough that, you can, that light can provide energy, photons can provide that energy. Um, and so if you have like some material that has a natural kind of um, electrical potential across it, which is quite common, then, then by um, bridging that band gap, current will flow, and that's so um, voltaic, a photovoltaic, as I said. And currently, well, actually, I didn't ch check this, so in, unless it's changed much from last year, the record last year was 44.7% um, efficiency. So um, it, the, the solar cell was able to extract 44.7% of the energy of the light and turn it into um, uh, energy, because eventually that electron you've knocked up into the next energy band, if you don't do anything to it, it will just fall back down um, and uh, then it will stop conducting. And if you run this in reverse, yes? Is there a maximum efficiency that you can reach? Um, I don't know if there's a maximum efficiency um, in this particular, I mean, probably no. Um, I don't see why there'd be a fundamental limit. It's just, it's just um, getting the material to absorb all of the light you shine on it is very difficult. Um, and progress has been relatively slow, I have to say. Um, so if you run all this in reverse, then you get a LED. So the band gap is of a fixed size. So when the electron drops back down across it, it lets out a photon of a, of a short, a small range of energies, and that's an LED, you know, a coloured bulb. Um, and so that's much more efficient process, for example, than say getting a little piece of metal and heating it up until it glows. Um, but most of the energy goes into heating the metal up, which is most light bulbs before um, LEDs and, and um, neons. Um, and so the, the physics Nobel Prize for 2014 this year was the blue LED. And so you can maybe start to think why that might be difficult because it requires quite a large band gap. So you need to have a material with quite a large band gap because a blue photon has a higher energy than say a red photon. But it's still got to be a small enough band gap that the light you, you, can, you have to apply lots of energy to make it emit a photon. So it's hard to find a balance. Right. Because um, uh, time's getting on. Um, so electrons move in a periodic way through solids. That was the idea that Felix Bloch had, and that laid, led to loads of predictions, such as interference between the wave functions different energies that the 
electrons can have leads to gaps in the possible energy that the electrons in the solid can have, and they're called band gaps, and that basically explains all, nearly all properties of solids. And so lots of chemists and material scientists spend their entire career <laughs> trying to calculate you know, the, the, the wave functions um, of electrons in materials um, and to, you know, to tailor the band gap and such like. So that's basically, um, you know, try and work out what might, might make a really good semiconductor and stuff. So that is what a vast amount of, of research into material sciences nowadays and engineering and, and um, electrical engineering. And it's very hard um, to accurately model real materials which aren't perfectly repeating crystals. Great, so now let's go out into um, some interesting areas of physics, into, into matter, which seems to be a little bit different from, say, just the table in front of you. So we're going to start about thinking about the resistance in a material, so particularly a metal. Say, if you try and pass a current through it as a resistance, you lose some of the energy as you go through. Um, it heats up, you know, as you pass the current through it. And it, this, this um, arises in the first place. Um, it wouldn't arise if you had a perfect crystal. It would just you wouldn't have any resistance. But it's because the electrons bounce off impurities as they go along through this crystal structure. So you know, if you don't have a pure material, it's always the same. And also, just even if you did have a very pure material, the fact that it has some kind of thermal temperature means that all of the atoms inside are, are shaking about. So the lattice constants are all changing. So they, they kind of bounce off, they scatter off those vibrations as well. So vibrations and impurities lead to resistances. And so as you lower the, the, the temperature, um, the resistance drops for, for nearly all materials. Um, and um, in fact, for many materials, the resistance vanishes completely and above absolute zero, which you can't reach anyway. So uh, it just completely vanishes and, and you get currents flowing with absolutely no resistance, which is first noticed by um, Camelions, um, uh, a Dutchman in 1911. And in fact, you know, he found a current. He can make a current flow persistently around the wire. You start the current flowing, and it just never stops. Right? It's true perpetual motion as long as it was kept cold enough. Um, and so, you know, if you just draw famous equation linking you know resistance um, and temperature yeah resistance drops away at zero temperature but this was happening above zero temperature and there was a long time of, of no ideas i think there's probably a review down at the bottom i've, I've, I've referenced there so here's a um inexhaustive list of people who worked on this problem and failed so that's um or and block and feynman and heisenberg and uh is that Levy? Uh, Lev Landau, yeah. And um, eventually, the people who did uh, work it out uh, were these three, Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer. The theory is called BTS still. That's Bardeen, who also got a Nobel Prize for the um, transistor. Um, so he got his second Nobel Prize in 1972. He's the only person to have got the Nobel Prize in physics twice. Um, so transistor and working out how superconductivity works. Um, I think it works. So, here are my electrons in my material. Okay, so here's my picture. This is the possible energy that they can have when they come in steps, in this case. So, you know, maybe there's some bands of energy they can have. Maybe these steps should have some width, actually, and they have different bands. Um, and I can fit two electrons in each one because of the power exclusion principle. I can't fit another thermal element. And then the idea they came up with is that as you decrease the temperature, these electrons can bond together somehow. They form a pair, which is called a Cooper pair. And if you have two fermions with a half integer spin, or in this case two electrons with a half, a half of spin, then any way you combine a half, two, two one halves, will always give you an in integer, right? So the total spin will be the sum of these. So you've got one pointing up and one pointing down, it goes to zero. So any way you combine these, they have an instant spin, uh, which is called a boson. And a boson doesn't obey the power exclusion principle. It can have any energy it damn likes. And so when that happens, what naturally happens is, with what you maybe expect, is 
things try and minimise their energy. There's no reason for something to have lots of energy if it can have a lower energy. And you would expect, if possible, all these electrons to sit in the lowest energy level. They're just not allowed by the power of the exclusion, exclusion principle. Bosons don't have that problem. So as you lower the temperature, they all end up sitting in the lowest energy they can have. And they can all sit down in these pairs. And as long as the temperature is low enough, they form these pairs, and then they can all sit in this lowest energy. Um, yeah. This, how does this help us? So here I'm going to draw a little picture. This is my solid, and it's got some kind of imperfection in it here. And here comes my Cooper pair, a pair of electrons in here, and it wants to whiz through, and so it does that, it would bounce off here, right? But the problem is, what does bouncing off something mean? So if you scatter something, then you impart a bit of your momentum to this guy, and so all that can happen if you, if this thing loses energy and slows down, which would be resistance, is the, it can either lose some energy or it can gain a little bit of energy from the vibrating atom. These are the two possible things. But we've got all of our two pairs now at the lowest energy level. There is no lower energy they can have. They've got no more energy to give up to this atom. So they can't give any energy to this latter. So there's, there's just no energy to give them in the lowest energy level. And they can't gain uh, any energy from this lattice until the energy they gain is, is big enough to get them to the next energy level because things can't just have any old energy, right, as we discuss. So um, as long as you get your material cold enough that it can't get a kick that's this big, these guys are frozen in at having this lowest energy. They can't go lower and they can't go higher. And this leads to superconductivity. So it means there's no scattering of these electrons. They don't scatter off any of the atoms inside the material. So they go with no resistance. And um, they don't always have to be very close to absolute zero. So for example, mercury, the resistance of mercury vanishes at four Kelvin. Um, and complicated materials like uh, indium, tin, barium, thulium, cuprate become superconductors at 150 Kelvin. Um, and uh, that is great because that's relatively cheap to cool something down to 150 Kelvin. No, that's not that cold, what's that? It's, uh, um, it's not much, much more than 120 degrees below zero. Um, um, but actually, even though we have this, this theory, we have no good theory for superconductors that work at these high temperatures. The, the theory still says you have to be pretty low, so still the theories for high temperature superconductors are, are still an open question. Yeah. Um, how's the negative resistance? Negative resistance? Yeah. Uh, well, in this case, I don't think negative resistance would have a meaning. That would only mean they'd pick up energy from this. Yeah. And they couldn't pick up any energy from this, they, unless they could pick up enough energy to get them to the next level, and then they'd start to heat the material. So, so this tends to be negative. I think this has nothing to do with negative energy. Yeah. Um, I thought you said negative energy was really Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, they, so they still, they, they will still be specific energy levels um, that they can have, but there's no limit to how many of them can have the same energy. The Pauli exclusion principle tells you no two identical fermions can have exactly the same quantum state. So two electrons with their spin pointing up would be an identical quantum state, and they could not sit at the same energy. If you flip one of the spins, then they can sit at the same energy. Bosons don't have to obey that rule. You can get them all to sit in the same energy, but that doesn't necessarily explain um, the possible energies they could have. That's set by the material, so um, that's why you get bang ups. Yeah. So this is always electrons, but there are other fermions in common matter. That There's not. There, there aren't other fermions. <laughs> it's um, in common matter, um, but well, kind of, and that will be next. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, good. So um, it all, another another property of, um, of of superconductors is that um, they mean that you if you can cool your without having to put loads of energy into cooling your superconductor down, then um, you can transmit energy with low power consumption because there's no resistance. You don't lose the energy as you send your voltage along a wire, and you can also produce very large magnetic fields. So circulating current produces a magnetic field. It's very hard to get a very large magnetic field because you need a very large circulating current, and that would normally 
cause huge amounts of heating and your material will just melt. If you have a superconductor, you can get a huge current circulating, make a huge magnetic field. And also, a property of them means they expel magnetic fields from the actual, um, from going into the superconducting material. And this is this explains maglev trains and such like. So let me just. Okay, so then the, the other thing that, that is very closely related to this is superfluidity. So here we've been talking about electrons, which are fermions moving through a material, and so they're charged electrons. Um, but atoms also sometimes move, say a glass of water is full of atoms and it moves if you pour it, right? And so again, atoms can either be fermions or bosons, um, and so if you have a very low temperature collection of atoms that are a boson, which means that they're, they're spin on average. So, for example, it'd be something where the atom is full of electrons. So they're all, all the pairs are full. And as long as you have an even number of electrons, no matter how you add up those halves, you always get an integer, right? So that would be a bosonic atom. And then an atom where you're missing one electron would be a fermionic atom. For example, um, and so what would happen here in exactly the same way as electrons moving through a solid. This is now this is now an actual pipe, like a, a pipe with a bump in it, and these are atoms. And in just the same way, if you send atoms through a pipe with a bump in it, they'll bump, bounce off the bump. But if their you know energy is if the temperature is low enough, they can't possibly bounce off that bump, and then you get um, superfluids. Fluids, um, I mean, you get motion without resistance, and you can set up resistant currents. So, if you get a cup of liquid helium and you stir it, it would still be stirring a million years later, it'd still be circulating. Um, and you can rotate the container and it won't move because there's no friction between the walls. Um, and so, I, I, I'm not gonna, I have to move on, so I don't have a video for this, but you should really look at superfluids because they're fantastic. So, for example, if you had a cup full of superfluid, it would just empty itself. Because um, the surface tension between a liquid and the side of a cup causes a capillary reaction, which causes the, the liquid to try and climb up the sides of the cup against gravity. But then there's resistance between the liquid and the cup, but you don't get that anymore. So if you have a cup of superfluid, it just empties itself. And if you have a narrow hole in the top, it fountains out. And then if you cut the bottom of your cup so that it fountains back out, you get an eternal fountain doing this. It's amazing. So that's one thing. And also, it's hard to do that because it would leak through the tiniest crack, right? So ask yourself how small a molecule of helium is. And you ask yourself if you can make a ceramic cup that's so perfect, it doesn't have a gap in it that's the size of helium or something, right? Or even water, right? And I didn't, until preparing these lectures last year, I hadn't ever really thought about this, right? Water molecules are tiny. Why don't they just spray out all the tiny little holes that you know are in ceramic? And the answer is because the resistance of squeezing um, a liquid for a tiny, tiny hole is huge. There's no resistance here. So if you have any slightly porous material, you just, it just sprays liquid helium or whatever out of its sides. So also thought to exist in the middle of neutron stars, perhaps the middle of neutron stars are a superfluid. And also it's the superfluid is how quantum field theorists describe the vacuum. So um, that's technical. Anyway, I mean, but then really not used so much. No one's really found a good use for superfluids. So uh, it's one of these strange things. Um, although actually in the last year, I've started to hear people coming up with, you know, some quite uh, um, interesting ideas. So for example, what they can do is they can make tiny little droplets of superfluid helium and spray them out into say a vacuum experiment or something. These tiny little droplets of superfluid helium and they could say embed a single molecule in that, and then they could study that molecule like without any resistance, you know, kind of would rotate without resistance. And they could do all kinds of stuff like that. So I've started seeing people coming up with ideas doing crazy experiments in liquid helium, but I mean, still, it, it's superfluids are, uh, are, are just the plaything of some scientists and don't seem to have really, no one's really come up with good use of them. So I can do that. So I'm almost done now. Finally, another useful thing, which is loosely connected, a uh, particular about lasers. So um, lasers are great. So here I found some old picture of me doing my PhD 
pre beard, sat in a sea of beautiful blue lasers um, and experiments and such like. And actually, this is an image from um, the experiment I'll bring in on the last lecture where I'm levitating an object in a laser beam. Um, the lasers can do all kinds of great stuff. Um, so, how is the laser? This is an acronym, which I've never written this one. And it stands for light amplification by spontaneous emission of radiation. And they work a little something like this. So here you have some material. And it's got some electrons in it. All materials seem to do. Um, and in this particular case, somehow, this, this electron has been kicked up into having a higher energy than its lowest energy. So eventually it'll fall down. But for now, it's up here. And what I do is I send in a photon. And that photon kicks that energy, that electron, and knocks it back down. So now I've still got my original photon, but then that electron, in dropping down, loses a photon as well. So I get two photons out. And so if I have my photon coming in, my piece of light, and I make sure that the, the energy of that photon is the same as this gap, then the two bits of light, the two photons that come out, will have exactly the same energy, and in fact will just add up, and they'll get bigger. A brighter piece of light of the energy, and then you send that further through the material and it knocks another electron down, and you have an even bigger one. And so, if it's really long, you get um, loads and loads and loads of this light all the same color. And if you put a mirror at each end, the light bounces backwards and forwards. So, you normally have to do something like apply a big voltage, it keeps on pushing these electrons up into the upper level, the light keeps on knocking it down, it keeps on pumping more and more light into this one particular color, and that makes gives you a laser. guy who came up with the laser, um, Maiman, who um, I'm not going to go into. Um, so yeah, so, so once you've, so this is called a population inversion, having, having all of the um, electrons up at the higher energy. So you have to put some energy in to make that happen. Um, but then actually after that, they can like behave as an amplifier for your input signal. So you put your signal in and then it will amplify that signal over and over. And so for example, microwave um, lasers, so lasers that work in the microwave spectrum of photons are used really uh, commonly to um, um, to amplify astronomical signals coming in, like these very weak ones that go through a maser, a microwave laser, and uh, amplify. And so, as scientists really like them for several reasons. One reason they're really useful is they're monochromatic, so they have one energy. So if you want to control something, um, say like the energy of an electron in an atom, then you've got this one monochromatic energy, so you can exactly change the electron from one energy level to another if you just choose the colour of the laser to be just the right colour. Um, and they're very useful in things like industry because um, actually because they're a single colour, it means you can focus it down to a very, very tiny spot. So um, the size of a spot you can focus light down to depends on, on how many different colours it has in it. So white light is very, very hard to focus down to a tiny point. Um, it will just, uh, all, because all the different colours focus in a slightly different place and white light is made up of all the colours. Um, but a single colour of light, you can focus it down to actually its wavelength in size. Um, so a tiny, tiny area. And so you can get some big high power laser and put it into a tiny, tiny area, which means you have a huge intensity of light. And that's what's used for say, cutting steel. So steel cutting lasers. Um, you can use lasers to cut through all kinds of stuff. Um, and there's all kinds of lasers. <laughs> so, masers, microwave, sasers. Anyone have a guess on sasers? A sound, sound laser. Um, and uh, people even say things like atom lasers, which is playing with uh, the idea of the wave particle nature of atoms and making uh, beams, monochromatic atoms. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So already, quantum physics has revolutionised our understanding of the world, and it's helped us understand all kinds of different stuff. So it explains all of particle physics, the particle, the, the physics of materials, the physics of chemistry. And it's led to like the invention of these really strange things, like superconductors and superfluids, and the explanation of those. Um, and, um, and a lot of that has come from... Um, combining ideas from, say, special relativity and quantum physics, and so unifying these different ideas. Um, 
and general relativity still evades us. But normally you don't really notice gravity much because they're very, very tiny, most of the systems you think of in quantum physics. And so they, gravity has a very small effect on them. But experiments are getting into that realm now. And with that, I'll finish.